Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the journey of a modern opera from conception to composition to its initial performances with those primarily responsible for this opera that is based on the life of Anne Frank, biographer, diarist, and author of her own lived experiences of the Holocaust as a young girl and woman. We are pleased to welcome for this discussion composer Shulamit Ran, who is Emerita Faculty of the University of Chicago, where she was the Andrew McLeish Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Music, Dr. Arthur Fagan, Professor of Music and Co-Chair of the Jacobs School of Music in the Department of Orchestral Conducting at Indiana University, and the Music Director of Atlanta Opera, and former Director General of the Atlanta Opera, Dennis Hanthorne, who by way of full disclosure works with M. Oppenheim. His description of how this opera came together led to this programming. So I'd like to thank you, Shulamit, Arthur, and Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing this interesting, interesting journey. It is so rare to have the composer, the librettist, and, and the originator of the idea all in one so that we can actually explore this, this journey with you. It's good to be here, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So I'd like to start off with, with you, Dennis, because the story that you told me of how this actually came to pass and your idea and how you approached author and then author's, I, author's own personal connection to this story, and then Shulamit, how you got, I, I just like to explore that because this is real, this is real stuff. How did Dennis this come to your attention and, and why did you come up with this idea of approaching Arthur with, with the idea of creating a modern opera out of the story that Anne Frank wrote in her diaries? Well, thank you, Mark. I've always been interested in the diary of Anne Frank. And as a general director, the greatest challenge of any general director is to commission a world premiere opera and produce it. And, and so then as the general director, you think, well, what type of opera can you produce that might have audience appeal? And the Die of Anne Frank is so popular worldwide. I remember reading it as you know, a young man or a young kid in school, and it affected my life as far as relevant and how it is affecting her life, how it affected her life, and how it's affecting today's life of everyone throughout the world. And so consequently, uh, it was always in the back of my mind. And when Arthur and I started working together back in the 90s, at one point he told me about his parents that were on Schindler's list. And when he was conducting for me in around 2008, I came up with the idea that we ought to think about commissioning the Diary of Anne Frank. And, and I went to Arthur immediately and I said, Arthur, what do you think of the idea of the Diary of Anne Frank? And he says, a terrific idea. And we need to see how we can move forward to get the rights and to find the right composer. And at that point, Arthur suggested Shulamet. And I think probably, Arthur, you need to pick up the ball here and, and what we did after that. So before we do that, Arthur, let me just sort of summarize this story, which really defies summarization. Anne Frank Diary came out of her captivity. Um, it, was, it was written over a two-year period from June 12th, her birthday when she got this blank book of a diary to August 1st, just a few days, August 1st of 19, uh, 1944, just a few days before her family were arrested by the Nazis. And she describes her experiences and thoughts in a way that is resonance throughout history for all young girls, all young children who are caught within conflict, uh, regardless of geography or, or background. This is a universal story. She died in Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in late February, early March of 1945, just weeks before the camp was liberated by British troops. And of the eight who hid together, including Anne and her father, her father was the only one who survived the war. Arthur, could you pick it up from there in terms of your own personal connection to this, to this story and how that conversation with Dennis led to your own involvement in this project? Okay. Um, well, as the son of Holocaust survivors, I've always felt that part of my mission in life was to keep the memory of the Holocaust alive through my very limited means as a performing musician. And I've arranged for Holocaust memorial concerts with various organizations 
where I've been music director, such as the Queen Symphony in New York, and also in my function as general music director in Germany in Dortmund. And at that time, when Dennis proposed the idea, I thought that this would be probably the the greatest contribution that we could make in terms of keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive through music and opera. I had worked with Shulamit first at Lyric Opera of Chicago, and I've also conducted a number of Shulamit's um, orchestral works, and I find that she's one of the most important composers uh, alive today. And also, because of her background, I feel that she would have a vested interest in such a project. And I forget, Dennis, was it you who first suggested to Shulamit the idea of the Ed Frank No, opera? you asked me, uh, you suggested that we might consider her for the composer. And I loved her music, um, her first opera. And so with that, I gave her a call and uh, we met in Chicago to discuss it. And we moved on from there. So Shulamit, you, you get a call from Dennis. You know the diary of Anne Frank. It is such a universal story. Yes. How, how, do you, yes. how do you receive that, that idea? Well, writing an opera, any opera, is a huge commitment. It's a huge commitment of time, uh, thought, energy. Uh, you know, an opera is, uh, this opera, what uh, it turned out to be, it's actually two and a half hours of music. But even before I knew that it would be of this length, I knew that this would be a major commitment. Nonetheless, having composed one opera between two worlds, the Dibbuk, uh, which Arthur Fagan had conducted in 1997 so brilliantly, I knew that I wanted to write at least one other opera because uh, the, the process is one that was uh, uh, incredibly demanding, but at the same time, truly, truly satisfying and exhilarating. Now, when Dennis called with the idea of an opera on Anne Frank, my first reaction was, well, twofold. <laughs> I said to Dennis, I really want to talk to Charles Kondek. Now, Charles Kondek is my librettist. I think of him as my librettist. Uh, obviously, as a librettist, he's worked with other composers as well. But we had a wonderful collaboration on Between Two Worlds. And I knew that if anyone would be able to think of Anne Frank in operatic terms, because it's not a natural uh, subject matter for an opera, it would be Charlie. And so that was one thing that I said to Dennis, I, I'm, I, I'm really intrigued by the idea, but I want to talk to Charlie and see how we can think about it together. And then the second question was, do you have the rights? <laughs> <laughs> now, composers, uh, we know that rights issues can be very, very complicated. And so uh, there was just no question that this was something that needed to be dealt with. And therein, uh, the next decade, I think, was spent uh, in search of those rights. Uh, I think we could almost do another opera uh, <laughs> looking for the rights uh, for Anne Franks for the diary. But in any case, um, it was a com complicated uh, process and uh, maybe Maybe uh, Dennis and Arthur can tell you a little bit more about it. But in any case, it didn't take long for me to already feel very bound with the idea of doing this opera. Uh, I've written other work, I mean, as a whole, my catalog of music, uh, orchestral and uh, chamber music and so on and so on uh, ranges, uh, you know, much, much of it is so-called abstract music. But nonetheless, I have a number of works and there are key works in my catalog that do have something to do with this topic of the Holocaust. I will use Arthur's words. It is about keeping the memory alive. And, and, and I think that the, 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 the significance of the Holocaust is not just a significance for those who experienced it themselves through their families. It's not just a significance for uh, Jews. It's the idea of an event that targeted a people 
uh, and uh, attempted to decimate that people and eliminate an entire culture. And we're seeing this yep. today. We saw it so many different expressions in Rwanda and what's going on in the Ukraine right now. Um, let's just, before we get onto these larger topics, um, let's continue to go along the thread of acquiring the rights, because I think I, in order to get to the point where there is an actual work, as you so correctly point out, Shulamit, what about the rights? Dennis, Arthur, how did that unfold so that you were able to convince those people who held the rights, first of all, identify who held the rights, and then convince those people who held these precious rights that they do not blithely give away. They want to make sure it is done properly. How did you go through that process? Well, Mark, uh, we determined that the rights were held by the Anne Frank Foundation in Basel, Switzerland. And the head of that foundation uh, was Buddy Elias, Anne Frank's oldest relative living, her cousin. And next step was just to find his phone number and get a hold of the foundation and see if we get an audience. And it took us two years, Arthur, I think, as I recall, even to get a, a meeting with him. And well, not... actually, uh, Stefan Lano lived in Basel and knew Buddy. Yeah, yeah. And I checked with Stefan and he had gave me Buddy's telephone number. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, it's interesting because it's a combination of sort of <laughs> business process, workflow, you know, being in the profession, so on and so forth. But it's also this personal connection. Right, Arthur? I mean, these, yes. these kind of coincidences are so important to the creation of anything. So you have to you have to open yourself up for that kind of thing, right? Because until that point, the Anne Frank Foundation had never given permission to any opera company to do a full main stage production of the diary. There have been chamber operas based on the diary, but never one that involved, you know, an a major production with a big orchestra, chorus, and, and and soloists. And the trust is so important. So your parents, I guess, were saved through this um, work that Schindler did. And um, could you tell tell us a little bit about that? I don't want to penetrate too much into your private life, but it is important to, to create this idea of trust. And I'm sure that that must have must have uh, helped to bridge that gap of trust. Well, I think in terms of dealing with Buddy, uh, uh, Buddy Elias, when I recounted to him my whole family history about my parents going through the concentration camps, um, he became very sympathetic to the idea. And that that came out of out of a trust that you would actually do justice to that trust that he would give to you, right? Yes, and I just want to mention that both Dennis and I went to see him in Basel in the fall of 2011, mm -hmm. and we spent the entire day pretty much with with Buddy and his his wife Gerty, and so it became it became more than just a business connection. It became a it became a friendship. And and Dennis, so when you're when you're talking about such a sensitive issue of of creating an artwork out of a personal tragedy, out of, out of personal experience. Um, how does that, that function in a way? Because you've got, on the one hand, you are trying to create a connection, right? On the other hand, you're also, you also need to get to the point where people are signing agreements that cede rights to you and place those into your hands. So, Talk a little bit about how that, that meeting uh, occurred. And then I'd like to go over to Shulamit because there's got to be some connection again, a personal connection that unfolds as you're beginning to write, right? I'd like to understand how you interacted with the family as well and, and with the foundation. Uh, Dennis, could you just talk a little bit about how you brought that together? Well, after Arthur and I had arranged the meeting to meet with uh, Buddy and his wife, and we talked about our desire and why we wanted to produce an opera based on the Diary of Anne Frank and how it has affected our lives and how it's affected so many folks, individuals all over the world. And we thought it was important. It was important to continue to communicate the message, as Arthur was saying, um, about the tragedy of the Holocaust. And 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 then Arthur and, and Buddy started talking about the relationship between Schindler's List and his relationship 
you know, the family throughout the war. And during that conversation, there was a bond that developed between Arthur and Buddy that suddenly Arthur, Buddy is, look, I says, I will give you the rights to do this. And I remember standing up after we had been there for nearly all day, Buddy grabbed me by the shoulders and he looked at me straight in the eye, got very close to me, said, Dennis, promise me one thing. Maintain the integrity of Anne Frank. Promise me that you will do that and, and keep it true to the diary. I said, you got my word. And he said, you've got the rights. It was, it was the most incredible experience that I had ever experienced to be among much of the furniture that was in the Frank family uh, apartment and home and all the pictures around there and to be meeting with him and hearing the heritage and tradition and the connection with Anne and them growing up. And it was just an unbelievable experience. And I'll never forget that. I might point out that both Anne Frank and Buddy Elias were born and grew up in Frankfurt. But when the war started, the family split. So Otto Frank moved his family to Amsterdam and Buddy's family moved to uh, Basel. And because they were in Switzerland, they, they survived the war. And so Schulman, then you're, you're brought in having, having Arthur and Dennis made this, com this very personal commitment. You're brought in to this whole process and you bring your librettist in. Do you have connection now to the the uh, the family, or are you now working more in isolation with the source material as you're developing your work? Well, uh, you know, the only actual connection that I had with the family was this one phone call that uh, it was actually a phone call that Dennis had made to me, where he had Buddy and his wife, Gertie, on the telephone. And uh, uh, he introduced us on the phone. And they were so excited because by then they had already made the decision to allow us to have those rights. Never mind that afterwards, years followed uh, dealing with the legalese of it, with the foundation, the Anne Frank funds in Basel. But they had made that uh, commitment, that agreement, and they were so thrilled and so warm and so looking forward to seeing how this work would result and uh, uh, what actually it would be. Unfortunately, uh, neither one lived to actually hear uh, the opera, but um, the excitement was such that it sort of it accompanied me through this journey and of course uh, by then also we already had parts of the libretto so that they were able to read and get a sense of what that would be like and they also part of our agreement was that the foundation would be allowed to read the libretto and make sure that it was indeed uh, in accordance with their, uh, or not against their desires in some way, I would say. They were indeed, as uh, Arthur and Dennis were saying before, they were very protective of it, and understandably so, because you can take that subject matter and turn it into all sorts of things, I suppose. Uh, but of course, there was nothing that I wanted more than to give real expression to the spirit of Anne Frank uh, and not in any way to manipulate it otherwise. However, uh, one thing that I should also mention, and this is one of the things that was very important to me and to Charles Kondek, my librettist, we both knew right from the start that we wanted the opera to have sort of a parallel tracks and melding and blending together at different times, the outside world. In other words, it was not going to be an opera that would be strictly about what was happening inside that small... Uh, the annex. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. That it would not just be what is happening inside of the annex, but it's some way to also constantly remind you 
of the outside. Let's break a little bit and just to show the viewers a, a little bit of your uh, of, of your work. So let's let's listen for a bit. So we just heard a segment that is about Anne's receipt of the diary. Now you also have another element, which is uh, the chorus, which reflects what is going on outside of this uh, annex. So let's listen to that. So Shulamit, we've heard two segments now, one where Anne has received the diary and the other a chorus that reflects the what is going on in the outside world. Talk a little bit about how you and your librettist thought about juxtaposing those two elements and how that then informs how the opera unfolds from there. Well, yes, our thinking was that there would be this character that is actually a collective, a group of prisoners. And there are times where they are brought in separately, such as the very beginning, where you have uh, prisoners that are coming in and signing in. There is a guard sitting there, signing them in, they are giving him their names, their place where they came from, their profession, and one by one they are coming in. So you have this uh, separate characters who will stay on for essentially the entire opera by the sideways of the stage, but there are these moments, these critical moments where they're all coming, come in and you can see gradually throughout the opera how when they first came in, they were dressed like proper business people, family people with their nice clothes and suitcases. And little by little, they become these figures of shivering, trembling, um, dressed in rags people so that there is this progression on the one hand. And you basically have the individual give up their identity to become a collective. The collective becomes a character, this Greek chorus that reflects the tragedy where yeah. you have this girl who in her hiding place with her family can retain her individuality until that time when she too ends up uh, becoming part of that of that group who who are destined to toward death in in a place like Bergen Belsen. And remember, Anne Frank, she didn't know what the end was going to be like. So right. the opera, for much of the opera, she's trying to live the life of a young girl who is at the point of transition in her life. She is, as the opera progresses, she's 
blooming into uh, a young, uh, very young woman, and she's discovering all sorts of things about herself, about uh, how she envisions life uh, when she's out. Uh, she is gaining a sense of her own uh, no, her womanhood and her own uh, a personhood. She retains an optimism about her for much of the opera, so there are times that you see her, for example, striving to see just a little piece of the outside, where the color of green for her is something that means hope, but she doesn't see that kind of green. The only green that she sees at home is a uh, worn out, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a plant that is no longer really a plant and so on. So you see that her aware, but at the same time, always retain her hope and her optimism and just waiting to be out and be again with her friends and living a normal life. Now, Arthur, let's talk about the initial interactions that you had. Shulamit, you conveying this work to Arthur. Dennis ends up leaving Atlanta Opera and joins our firm. So you now have different, different uh, management to deal with. Uh, talk a little bit about how that transpired and how you had your first rehearsals together. Okay, uh, I was first given what they call the piano vocal score, which is the uh, music written at first just for four hands piano with all the vocal lines. But that's a way of becoming acquainted with the music. And we set up certain we set up a, a number of workshops at Indiana University, and I got to uh, rehearse for these workshops individually with all the singers and spent many, many hours doing that. And I became very, very well acquainted with the music itself, not yet with the orchestration because the full full orchestra score came later. So over a period of several years, we did a workshop once for the first act and then a workshop for the second act. And by doing that, we become, you know, it, 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 I, I, I had a lot of time to really internalize the music and, 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 and be able to get an idea of how it should be shaped, and of course, Shula be guided be all along that path. We guided each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, this is the thing, right? You've got a an artistic endeavor, an emotional journey a creative process. You also have the practical issue of where you're going to rehearse, how you're going to bring musicians together, how you can focus on a piece before you have to go back to your life of conducting other works or your life of teaching other uh, other students, right? So you're, you're managing your time as you're trying to bring together a, a total performance. And Dennis, as a manager, Right. I mean, that was part of the art of the uh, the general director of, of an opera, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And uh, we had the ultimate responsibility of raising the money to produce the opera, you know, to pay for all the composer, pay for the orchestration, then pay for the sets and the costumes. And that's a long, long period of time in making that happen and finding individuals that's interested in this and, and supporting it and committed and then we'll fund it. And that's one person at a time. And we had a few meetings like that, and lunches and dinners, and we were successful. So I know that you're still in the process of, of, of evolving the performance and finding an audience for it and finding people, uh, finding organizations to, to perform it. Where are you right now in the arc of this creative process of connecting audiences to this work? We have to be careful in who we mention as far as any names. We're talking to major performing arts centers, not performing arts uh, major opera companies throughout North America and in Europe and trying to get interest in producing it. This is not a small feat in as far as producing it. Uh, it's very expensive to remount a work like this. And so someone has to be committed to the financial resources in order to make this happen and provide enough rehearsals time for the chorus and the orchestra, because this is one of the most difficult, as Arthur said to me, this is one of the most difficult pieces that he's ever conducted. And and he conducted it 
really, really well in in, 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 in Bloomington. And it, it was fantastic. And so it doesn't sound hard, but it's very, I think, very easy for the listener to hear what's going on. But Shulamit's done a magnificent job as far as pulling together a lot of complexities to make it easy for the listener to, to hear. But it also continues the message in a major way that audiences are affected by the story from the diary. So this is part of the process, right? You need champions, you need right. funders, you need space, you need performers, you need an orchestra, right? Right, Arthur? Right. <laughs> a good orchestra. <laughs> right? You need so this is this is exactly the challenge that we are facing in modern opera. It is so much easier to take the familiar from the past of 100, 200, 300 years ago and perform that rather than the new works. Um, are you finding, Shulamit, that, that um, the, the uh, area of opera, the art form of opera, is embracing of new works, including those that you compose, um, including that those that, that uh, colleagues compose? Or is there so much resistance and so much adherence to the convenience of repetition of the familiar that it basically makes it very difficult for new works to find a stage. How do you see it? Well, you know, I think it's some of both. I think that some opera companies, even major opera companies, are very much bound to the past. Um, and yeah, I would be the last one not to say uh, I love the past. I mean, the great operas of the past, uh, but uh, I think that uh, you don't want an opera house just as an orchestra or any other uh, organization to turn into a museum where all you do is present the past. And I think that actually there is much more interest also now in new operas that uh, I think that uh, some opera houses at least are realizing that in opera you have an art form that draws on everything, on the visual, on the dramatic, on the stage, on the design and so on, and that those things have, uh, can draw audiences. What will happen to this opera? I've always said that the composer needs to have long-term patience. So <laughs> I will be patient, but not too patient. <laughs> I really, really want, hope to hear this opera done again. Um, and I just want to point to the university, uh, Indiana University at Bloomington, and give that university credit for hosting this process, for giving a place to artists and to students to create. I mean, that is something that is of tremendous, tremendous value to the sector. You know, I don't think that the Diary of Anne Frank is in essence a story that is owned by one ethnicity or one religion. It's, a, it's such a universal story. It is the power of the story that this young girl composed and the power of your opera is to convey that idea across all sorts of different life experiences. Thank you so much for helping us to understand the work that you've done, Shulamit Ran, Emerita Faculty at the University of Chicago, conductor uh, Arthur Fagan, professor of music, and co-chair of the Jacobs School of Music, a Department of Orchestral Conducting at Indiana University, and music director of the Atlanta Opera, and former director general of the Atlanta Opera, Dennis Hathorn. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. This has just been a great conversation and a real gift.